شلام علیه خون و این دم نم بسیم رابقه شرکت دیو خون قده هم زمتا Good afternoon and I want to thank everybody for making the time to visit and uh, attend this lecture. I know the convention in Arizona itself is full of distractions, so it's a testament to everyone here that they're willing to show up and uh, listen, to this uh, listen to this lecture. The topic I was given by the conference organizers um, was the Kurdistan regional government's uh, pending referendum and its implications for Assyrian autonomy. And what I intend to do is spark a debate. We can do it as a Q&A, but I want to equip you with a better understanding and a better context, even a historical context, of the Kurdish, the Kurdish people's pursuit, especially in Iraq, for their own autonomy and their national interest and what it's meant for the Assyrian people. But first, I'll just give you a macro overview. And uh, let me also just say, as by way of introduction, um, I'm a secretary on the board of the Ninway Plain Defense Fund uh, under the Foreign Agents Registration Act. We're registered with the Department of Justice. Um, I'd also like to recognize fellow board members in the room, uh, Alex David, Dr. Elmer Abo, and also our legal counsel and someone who's going to be honored at this convention for his efforts uh, to help our people, Mr. Joe Schmitz, uh, who's our legal counsel with the Ninway Plain Defense Fund. I'm also a PhD candidate for far too long at this point at the University of Toronto. So a macro dynamic of the referendum, it, it, uh, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. It's considered widely to be a very populist measure by a president in the Kurdistan region who's facing a legitimacy crisis. President Masoud Barzani is on the verge of socioeconomic collapse and bankruptcy. Uh, the only reason he's in power is because he's extended his term outside of a constitutional mandate even within the KRG by expelling his main uh, opposition in the Kurdistan region. So this is a context of political, economic, and even security turmoil. Uh, President Barzani is also facing a closing window in his estimation. He doesn't know, the Kurdistan region of Iraq doesn't know how much longer America's interests in fighting ISIL aligns with the Kurdistan regional government's involvement in that fight with ISIL. As the threat diminishes, as success against ISIS increases, that interdependence may, that interdependent dynamic mutual shared interest between them might change. And so the window of opportunity is closing. So all things are impelling a referendum from the office of the president of the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Countries, and I'm saying shades because none, none of this is absolute. Uh, people are going to talk in ways that give them room for maneuver politically. But if we say shades of those with support, you're looking at Israel, Kosovo, Poland. Those who say they disagree or are not outrightly supportive include the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, Russia. Those who oppose outright are the most unsurprising list, uh, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and Syria. The referendum itself is not constitutional, it's not binding, but it's considered to be the basis of negotiations between President Barzani and the leadership in, in Baghdad. But we're all here because we're more interested, and the topic is what it means for Assyrian rights and the Assyrian pursuit of self-determination and autonomy. So let's look at the Assyrian dynamic. In terms of those who say yes to a referendum in the KRG and include the Ninwe Plains in that yes, we have the Bet Nahran Democratic Party, the Bet Nahran Patriotic Union, which is the Doronoye, the Chaldean Assyrian Syriac Popular Council, which is Majdi Shabi, the De Chaldean Democratic Forum, the Chaldean National Council, Keldo Asher Organization, and Syriac Assembly Movement. And those are groups that have indicated that they are pro-referendum and include the Ninwe Plains in that referendum. Those who are KRG conditional and Ninwe Plain no are reflected by those who stood by the March 6 joint statement. I'll explain what the March 6 joint statement is. And includes two of the Brussels boycotters, the Brussels conference that uh, MEP Lars Adakitson held, um, in which several organizations uh, boycotted, including the Assyrian Democratic Movement and Abne Nahren. 
So those who signed on to the Brussels statement, what did they say? They said an Inwe Plains Council should be created and its mandate is to, pre to prepare for the rebuilding phase. The representatives of the local councils, political parties and NGOs will elect an interim Ninwe Plain Council reflecting ethnic diversity. Now, when you say this is a completely unconstitutional, it, in, there's no precedent for something like this to exist anywhere in Iraq. It's, a, it's an extra legal measure. Uh, and it would include those entities that have been created by the Kurdistan Democratic Party, and that's its purpose. And unsurprisingly, since it would include those elements, what is their mandate? They should engage in a negotiation with the Iraqi central government and the KRG in order to achieve recognition of the interim Ninwe Plain Council and the interim Ninwe Plain Command and an agreement to have a referendum. It's very explicit. It's very clear. No one's hiding anything. In addition, on the security dimension of the Brussels Statement, a military coordination committee among our present militias should be formed under the supervision of the international coalition forces, the central government, and the KRG to maintain security on the Ninwe Plain, pending the formation of a unified Ninwe Plain defense force. This would represent the pre-ISIS status quo. The very same security arrangement with Peshmerga influence that allowed them to disarm us three weeks before ISIS attacked and then affect a calculated withdrawal. A calculated withdrawal the day before ISIS attack without warning the inhabitants of the Ninwe Plains in order to expose them to maximum violence, maximum genocidal violence. But just to hammer the point home and make sure that there's no conspiracy theory behind this, that there's no real debate behind it, and, and in fact the parties who represent this pro-KRG referendum, pro-Ninwe Plains referendum, uh, at the front line of it is the representatives of Majlis Shabi. So Wahida Hurmuz, who heads the Majlis Shabi parliamentary delegation in the Kurdistan region's uh, legislature, is quoted in Bas News on November 28, 2016, saying, Christians are seeking a self-ruling administration in the Ninwe Plain annexed to the Kurdistan region. She actually doesn't even hide the fact that it wouldn't be a legal process. It would be an annexation. <clears throat> And the way Mikhail goes a step further and clarifies that the Brussels conference was expressly to facilitate this agenda when he said, we as Chaldean Syriac Assyrian Popular Council, Medjish Shabi, are supportive of this referendum. I will say 80% will join the referendum and also we are the people who fled from the Ninwe Plain. We will be willing to geographically join the Kurdistan regional government and be part of Kurdistan. This is what most of the political parties, religious leaders agreed on at the Brussels conference. A very clear agenda. Very clear. <clears throat> so what was that agenda attacking? What was that agenda trying to undermine? It was trying to undermine a March 6th joint statement signed by 10 of our political parties. The seven who were in Brussels, in, a, in addition to those who boycotted, such as the Assyrian Democratic Movement. The March 6 joint statement said, we demand the activation and implementation of resolution number 16 issued by the Iraqi Council of Ministers in its meeting on Jan 21, 2014, giving preliminary approval for the creation of an Ninwe Plains province. UNAMI will have the right to monitor the security situation and rehabilitation efforts, reducing exploitation and preventing the imposition of hegemonic policies across the Ninwe Plains and demanding that the Ninwe Plain be excluded from all military and political conflicts and that its borders be considered a green line. A green line would require the Peshmerga to actually withdraw from the Ninwe Plains entirely. That's what it's a reference to. And the people of the Ninwe Plain region should be granted their constitutional right to administer their areas and should be enabled to defend themselves and protect their properties with the integration of all private security forces formed by minorities under Iraqi federal and local police, federal forces and local police. This is a clear agenda to have a standalone Ninwe Plains province created in order to achieve the maximum degree of autonomy under Iraq's federal system. Certainly not any kind of perfect system by any measure, but it's the maximum. And clearly the Brussels document stands on all levels, authority, autonomy, security arrangements, in stark contrast, it undermines this. And why would the March 6 statement signers who also boycotted Brussels 
such as the Assyrian Democratic Movement, why would they be pursuing that maximum level of autonomy through a province? Law number 21, 2008, it's been amended uh, uh, several times, but it is the law on provinces. What does it provide for? It says a provincial council is the highest legislative and oversight authority operating within the administrative boundaries of a province. Right to issue local legislation within the provincial boundaries and enable it to run its own affairs within the principle of a decentralized administration. In addition to that, it can issue local legislation, regulations, and instructions to regulate administrative and fiscal affairs, formulate general policies of the province in coordination with the concerned ministries in the field of developing plans for the province, prepare the council's draft budget to include it in the province's general budget and ratify the draft general budget. So this is legislative budget authority that a province has. But guess what? Once you have a province, if things are not going your way, you also have a constitutional basis in which to become a region. So law number 13 of 2008, law of the executive procedures regarding the formation of regions, allows that measure of becoming a province, which the March 6 signatories and Brussels boycotters, which narrows it down to just a couple, such as the Assyrian Democratic Movement and Abnen Ahren, have a mechanism as a policy, there's a mechanism to become a region, maximum level of autonomy. So Brussels was a direct attack on that. But Brussels was only the most recent in a phase of KRG actions to undermine our agenda to attain an Inuit Plains province. Consolidation is directed at what is happening within areas that the KRG controls. But of course, the areas that the KRG already controls, their formal jurisdiction, is a great litmus test, is a great barometer. In fact, the canary in the coal mine for what our autonomy would look like tied to them. In Ankawa, we are now seeing structured, deliberate encroachment to change the demographic face of our most significant urban area of concentration within the KRG. It's being Kurdified. Across the Kurdistan region of Iraq, over 150 documented cases of mass village and land theft. The KRG constitution amendment process or drafting process resulted in the only representative, Dr. Munayaku, walking off because we weren't seeing our existing rights entrenched and built on. We were actually seeing our existing rights diminished. Let me give you the clearest example of that. We have five quota seats since 1991, five quota seats in the Kurdistan Regional Government's Legislative Assembly, guaranteed. The draft constitution that they've amended, that they want to push forward, now says the Kurdistan region's electoral commission determines how many and what quota seats are available. You do not have to have any degree in political science to do the math on that. That's about saying, if we approve your candidates, you can have a quota seat. If we don't like your candidates, oh, guess what? There's no quota seat. And political suffocation in the form of creation of political parties to drown out independent and legitimate political parties. But it's in the expansion area, specifically the Ninwe Plains, that we see the most direct confrontation of our efforts. In 2008, then Congressman Mark Kirk confronted the United States Ambassador Ryan Crocker in a hearing about a two-year-old standing order to create a formal legitimate security force in the Ninwet Plain, a force that the United States military and United States administration supported as part of its agenda of having Iraqis stand up so that Americans could stand down and come home. For two years, that order was blocked. But in a hearing on the Hill, Congressman Mark Kirk got Ryan, Ambassador Ryan Crocker to accept the creation of a Ninwe Plains police force per that 2006 standing order, and it did get underway. It started in April. The first order was for 711. Max force structure was to be 5,000. But we didn't make it to August, and we didn't make it to 450 before the KDP-controlled Ninwe Provincial Council 
began disassembling and dismembering that security force. And as a result, we were left with Peshmerga and the Christian Guard, paid for by the KDP, imported into the Ninwe Plains, the very same forces who either disarmed us or were disarmed and then effected a calculated withdrawal, exposing us to the genocidal violence that completely cleansed us from our ancestral lands in the Ninwe Plain. And today we see the removal and replacement of elected officials. I'll come to more on that in a moment. So political control of our voice, control of all funds so that we are completely economically dependent, and coercion of those Ninwe Plains officials that can't be replaced. So what does KRG-based autonomy look like? It's okay if you, you can't read that. But this is an excerpt from WikiLeaks. This is an excerpt of then Finance Minister Sergis Aghajan, an Assyrian and senior ranking member of the Kurdistan Democratic Party, speaking to Zalmay Khalilizad, the U.S. ambassador at the time. And Sergis Aghajan said to him, in confidence, he was speaking in confidence. And thanks to private, I know there was a gender change, Manning, Chelsea Manning, um, we now have this information. Sergis accused Kurds, especially those associated with the KDP, which controls the Assyrian centers in Dohuk, of continuing to take over Assyrian land. During the three years since 2003, he said Assyrians are returning to their ancestral villages and want their village lands. Sergis said Kurds receive priority in law and challenges in court are not resolved in favor of non-Kurds. Sergis pointed out that in order to regain and retain Assyrian land, the village populations must be strong and stable. What is he saying exactly? What is he saying? He is saying that our existence is contingent on access to our land to which we have a right, but by law and in practice, we are second-class citizens. It's a neo-apartheid state. This is a senior ranking member of the KDP speaking in confidence to the United States ambassador to Iraq. But what else did he say? And this goes to the political suffocation. Sergis alleged that other so-called Christian parties were formed and influenced by the KDP. And I want you to hang on to that. It's very important. Noting, of course, that it's actually Sergis Aghajan who created Mejdi Shabi. Mejdi Shabi, who I just quoted, led on the Brussels conference and publicly declares the need to annex the Ninwe Plains to Kurdistan region of Iraq. What else does KRG-based autonomy look like? Well, we just got word that those Assyrians in El Qush protesting the illegal, unconstitutional, dictatorial removal of their mayor to be replaced by a ranking member of the KDP are now being individually threatened. They are being told they are no longer allowed to organize protest. Freedom of assembly, gone. They are no longer allowed to speak their words. Freedom of speech, gone. That is KRG-based autonomy. But is this new? Are we experiencing something new? Are Assyrians confronting something never seen before? Sadly, not. KRG oppression, or this specific form of KRG oppression, is a learned behavior. While this is a publication that comes from 1977, from the Republic of Iraq's Ministry of Information, it's actually a law passed in 1974, the Kurdistan Autonomy Law. Article 1, the following paragraph shall be added to Article 8. This is a constitutional amendment in Iraq that the Republican Command Council approved. The region whose majority of population is from Kurds shall enjoy autonomy in accordance with what is defined by the law. Autonomy. They were given autonomy. 1974. Let's look at what that autonomy looked like on paper. 
the President of the Republic entrusts one of the members of the Legislative Council to preside over and formulate the Executive Council. So you can have autonomy, but I pick your leader. Clause F. The President of the Republic is entitled to release the President of the Executive Council from his post, and in this case, the Council shall be deemed as dissolved. Meaning, if I pick someone and they start doing something I don't like, I can remove them. That's the autonomy they were given. Article 17. Police, security, and nationality formations in the region shall be attached to their directorates general in the Ministry of the Interior, Wazarat Beledia. Beledia. Dakhaliya, Wazarat Dakhaliya. And all their personnel shall be ruled by the provisions of laws, regulations, and instructions applied in the Republic of Iraq. We control your executive branch and we control your security branch. That's what that says. That's the autonomy the Kurds were given in 1974 by the government of Iraq, the authoritarian dictatorship in Baghdad. Article 18, on their legislative authority. <laughs> Offices of the central authority in the region shall be subjected to the ministries to which they are attached and shall exercise their work within the limits of their competences. The bodies of autonomy are entitled to submit reports about them to the ministries they are attached to. We determine all of your policies. Resolutions of the autonomy's bodies, the KRG autonomy's bodies, which the observation body, a monitoring structure that serves Baghdad, decides on as illegal shall be deemed as nil and void totally or partially right from the date of their issuance, and all legal effects ensued from them shall be abolished. If you pass a law or resolution we don't like, it's dead in the water. That's your legislative authority. Executive, security, and legislative authority. This is the learned experience of the Kurdish people in Iraq, pursuing their rights. They have rights. They certainly do. No one is against that. Fundamental human rights. But we need to understand that what's happening to us today is part of a historical context, a historical trajectory. What was the KRG's reaction to this clearly false autonomy? In a memorandum that's now been made public within the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, a memorandum to the Honorable Henry A. Kissinger, Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, National Security Affairs, the transmittal was, we are transmitting to you as an attachment to this memorandum the verbatim text of the Kurdish Democratic Party's proposed autonomy plan. The KDP has planned to broadcast this memorandum as its answer to the Iraqi government's own autonomy plan. So this is the Kurdish nationalist reaction to the false autonomy being imposed on them by the government of Iraq. Just very quickly, the four-year period is Saddam Hussein, then Vice President Saddam Hussein, went and sat with Mullah Mustafa Barzani and penned on paper a memorandum of understanding on autonomy. And for four years, that written document in which Mullah Mustafa Barzani wrote down all of the authority and autonomy that he wanted was enacted as an interim measure with the understanding that it would be codified into law exactly four years later. By the way, the Baathists were buying time. They needed peace in the north so they could deal with issues in the south and with their neighbors. So as the four-year period of the agreement terminated, uh, Kurdish nationalists like Bayan Rahman's father, Sami Abdul Rahman, refers to those four years as a golden period. Universities were created, governors assumed posts, the Kurdish people progressed over those four years. University of Sulaymaniyah was created where some of my relatives and some ADM members also got their engineering degrees. The government of Iraq issued on March 11th, 1974, a defective law of autonomy which did not take into account the Kurdish plan or Kurdish views, views both in the fields of the provisions of the law or the areas to be covered by this law. The defective law. They go on to say, people are naturally entitled to the right of implementing the principles of autonomy within the Republic of Iraq, especially at a time when the ruling group has denied us this natural right and devoted itself to the cause of wiping out the declaration of March 11, 1970, the Golden Period Memorandum, and has unilaterally issued a demagogic law, demagogic law, in which the phrase Kurdish rights 
has been repeated aimlessly, and I emphasize, and makes efforts to implement this law through agents and mercenaries, despite its awareness that such endeavors would bear no fruit. Agents and mercenaries. In Kurdish nationalist colloquial discourse, they were called Jehush or Jash. Kurds who worked with the central authorities to undermine the Kurdish nationalist cause. And what did Sergis Aghajan refer to? KDP creating Assyrian proxies for Assyrian political rights. So the question is, what will be the Assyrian reaction to KRG oppression? Mullah Mustafa Barzani declared war in 1974. He went to war. Why? It's obvious, but I'll give you the truncated answer. He went to war because in the name of autonomy, he understood that the central government regime, it was a regime, it's always been a regime, it's always been authoritarian, and always was dictatorial, was going to kill his people's rights in the name of autonomy. This is a classic arose by any other name. Assyrians clearly face a similar form, a form of oppression. The patterns are actually almost identical. But Assyrians do not possess the same means of struggle. We don't have the people. We don't have the money. We don't have the guns. But... The KDP or KRG of 2017 is also not the government of Iraq of 1974. The government of Iraq in 1974 actually had some powerful allies. It was on the front line of crushing communism, so it had some nominal support from the West. The KDP KRG is far more dependent today than the government of Iraq was in 1974. It's far more exposed. So there are opportunities. And I've given this lecture and ended with a, noting just some of these opportunities for the purposes of hoping that I've equipped you with some historical context in which to arrive at an informed opinion of your own. So by my account, these opportunities include support for the Ninwe Plains Protection Units. Why? They are the only independent force resisting this entire agenda as a security force, on the security front. And what do I mean by independent? Because, of course, they operate under the authority of the central government of Iraq. What do I mean by saying independent? The NPU formed itself on its own. The Assyrian people created the Ninwe Plains Protection Units. It's an organic force on the ground that came together and it was stood up by donations and contributions and support within Iraq and from our diaspora. And it made a decision on where to be. And that's a reflection of its independence. It decided who it was going to operate under, what command structure it would fall under. And ultimately, it ended up being authorized to operate in the Ninwe Plains and secure the Ninwe Plains under Ninwe Liberation Operations Command. That, in turn, allowed it to have some support from the U.S. military on the ground. Special training, forces by spe training by special forces, U.S. special forces, and other forms of support. So there is some authority granted through the government of Iraq all based on strategic alliances and mutual interests, including the United States support. United States support on the ground didn't materialize because of any lobbying or advocacy or a National Defense Authorization Act. It happened because commanders on the ground who want to kill ISIS and expel them realized that they could work with these guys and that they had a shared goal. And so they did. Today, the Ninwe Plains is divided. It's divided because the Peshmerga took Tilkip and Bashika and built a wall. They cut it in half. But al is still nominally, and in terms of intent, 
secured by the Ninwa Plains Protection Units and others. It is the one area where the KRG is having trouble imposing its referendum agenda. That's direct resistance because they don't control the security apparatus there. We also need to label and politically neutralize what we call Sepiane. In the KRG's own memorandum, which the Central Intelligence Agency reported to the National Security Council, to National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, even in their memorandum they say there are agents and mercenaries, their own people working against them. They label them. They identify them in order to try to neutralize them politically. Mass mobilization and protest globally. Where we have freedom, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, we need to use it. We need to cherish it. But we also need to instrumentalize it. What amazes me in terms of our victimhood mentality, what boggles my mind, is that in the form of an NPU soldier or a political activist or an Elkosh protester, you have a hero, a heroine, standing up for their rights, not being silent, while a gun is actually pointed at them. And you can have a victim and a coward in the United States. It boggles my mind. Boggles my mind how you can have a hero or heroine in Atra who's actually facing the forces that clearly want to crush them, who are threatening them now. And we are silenced and made timid in the West, in England, in France, in Germany, in America. And of course, support for all free Assyrians, Aturai Akhire in occupied Assyria. Um, this slot was for 45 minutes. I've kept it to 33. And I thank you for indulging me for a half hour of my talking. But I hope I was successful in giving you some context and a historical trajectory of this development as you think about the issue of the KRG's referendum and what it means for our pursuit of our rights to self-determination and some measure of autonomy. Thank you very much. And I'm opening up the floor now to comments, questions.